This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nitsa Hone, and today is Saturday, and that means it's time for Nitsa Notes, my weekly vlog series about limited magic. We're still in Phyrexia All Will Be One limited season. We're still in the kind of early stages of the format, and as a result, I wanted to share with you five sort of big picture things in this format that you have to keep in mind if you're going to succeed. So first up, it's sort of a two-parter, and it just kind of has to do with your curve in the format, and that is your deck really needs to have one and two drops, but you also need to make sure you have a top end. So going into the format, it was clear it would be pretty fast, and then, you know, in the early days of the format, it was like, whoa, this format's even faster than expected, and a lot of people, including me, for a while were taking so many one and two drops and not really having a top end in their deck. And you kind of have to have a top end because, you know, as fast as the games are, if everyone is running one and two drops and things that interact and deal with the board, games do reach the, reach the later stages. There's sort of two stages to a lot of games where early, you're sort of just playing early creatures and attacking your opponent and, you know, using tricks and stuff like that. But then eventually the games do enter into sort of a board stall period and you kind of need five and six drops to help you push through. You know, like the five mana four five with the oil counters that can give things haste. Um, you know, the six mana six six trample equipment. You know, you need these sorts of things in your deck. So while the format is certainly fast and you certainly need to be playing one and two drops, you also kind of need big, impactful creatures, uh, largely creatures, but other things too, for the later stages of the game. So yes, the format's fast, but make sure you also have a top end, otherwise your opponent's top end is going to end up running over all of your small creatures in the later stages of the game. The next thing is uh, don't block. And I mean, that's I'm exaggerating a little here. It's not don't ever block, but... You block a lot less in this format than you would in most. Um, there are too many tricks that will just utterly blow you out. And what I mean by don't block is more accurately, don't block without keeping in mind that your opponent may have a trick that two for ones you, you know, like um, the two mana plus two plus two draw a card if the creature targeted is, you know, has toxic or the two mana plus three plus one exile the top card you can play it until end of turn. You need to be having those tricks in mind when your opponent has the mana to cast them. And if they do, and there's no way for you to interact in response or find a way to not get two for one, don't block, you know? And there's a lot of tricks like this that can just utterly blow you out if you're not careful. Um, and so in this early stage of the game, like I was talking about earlier, where both players are just playing early early stuff, it's pretty hard to block um, because especially, you know, whoever's turn it is has mana up and can attack uh, in mo on most board states. And it's mostly best not to block so you don't get utterly blown out by all of these tricks that can do that. Now, sometimes it's necessary to block. Sometimes you have to do it. Uh, usually that's not true in the early stages of the game, but sometimes it happens and you just have to do it. Um, also, obviously blocking and then leaving up your own form of interaction, like that's a whole other thing. If you have the ability to block and keep their trick in mind and you can do something about that trick in response, then you do block. But my basic point is don't block a whole lot. Don't try to trade with things early because there's a very good chance you'll just get blown out by a two for one trick, at which point the game is maybe not completely decided, but your chances of winning drop precipitously if you get wrecked by one of those tricks. Next up, it's blue is weak. It is the weakest color in the format but it's not unplayable. Um, I think I've seen people, you know, talk about how bad blue is, um, and a lot of people have responded by not playing blue at all, and I don't think it's quite that bad. Um, there are a couple of uncommons that entice me to go into blue a little bit, including uh, Unctus's Retrofitter, which I think is the best blue uncommon, uh, as well as the uh, Tamiyo's Icy Manipulator, the one that comes into play with oil counters and can tap stuff down. Those are uncommons that are good enough to take with first picks in a lot of packs. And then there's some great rares in blue too that should really pull you into those colors. The problem with blue is there really isn't a single common anywhere in blue that entices you to get into blue. And that's what makes it kind of 
it is what makes it the weakest color is it has the worst comments. Um, you know, the three mana one four that can remove oil counters and alter its stats. Like that's a good common, but it's not the kind of common that you see and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to take this and I'm going to go into blue. Whereas every other color has, you know, multiple commons that entice you, whether they're premium removal or really efficient creatures or whatever. Um, basically, I guess what I'm saying is don't draft blue unless there's one of these powerful cards that pulls you in, uh, but don't completely disregard blue either. Um, I think there's a happy medium to be had there. You know, the fact that blue is weaker than the other four colors, it's kind of a bummer, but this isn't a format where blue is so bad that you basically shouldn't play it. Like we saw in like Forgotten Realms, for example, it's certainly better than it was there. So keep blue in mind, don't disregard it entirely, but also don't lean in a blue direction unless you see something really significant. Another thing is, and I sort of alluded to this when talking about tricks, you've got to have cheap interaction in this format. Um, you know, blocking is very hard to do, as we've already discussed in the early game. But if you can do something, you know, use cheap removal to get rid of opposing things early, it can play a huge role in helping you win the game. You know, you get rid of some sort of synergistic card they play, like the one mana one two that can tap and get oil counters and, you know, trigger oil counter payoffs and all of that and ramp their mana. Killing that early when you can, when your opponent's tapped out, is a great idea. You do still need to be worried about tricks, you know, especially the ones that can make a creature indestructible and stuff like that. You have to be worried about that. But if you have cheap interaction, which generally I mean like cheap removal spells like Hex Gold Slash, uh, if you have this sort of thing, you can sort of counteract the problems with blocking because, you know, you can leave mana up to interact when your opponent tries to use a trick, and you can also just remove early creatures while your opponent's tapped out. It's hard to trade one for one with stuff you have on the board because blocking's so hard, but it's easier to do if you're using spells in your hand, and if you put your opponent behind on board in the early game, uh, it does play a big role in helping you get there. And then the last of these that I wanna mention is don't worry too much about poison. Um, I've seen a lot of people you know, that I've been playing or people talking about it that really, it's sort of like um, how newer players are sometimes with their life total where they don't, you know, they wanna chump block to avoid losing life because if your life gets to zero, you lose, right? But as we know, after playing a lot, you know, you, don't really want to chump block, especially in the early game. You want to be trading at worst. Um, so losing life is fine. And I've seen a lot of people play radically differently based on being really worried about poison. And there's really only two thresholds you should concern yourself with for poison. One of them is three, especially if you're playing against a black-white deck. That's because of all the cards with Corrupted. Um, to some extent, you should try to avoid getting to three poison against some decks in the format but you still shouldn't be so scared about it that you're chump blocking or not attacking your opponent when you have good attacks because you're more worried about poison. And this is even more of a problem because blocking is so hard in the format early that you know if you decide not to attack your opponent, you're usually missing out on a big advantage um, because your opponent's just gonna attack you and have a trick up. So um, don't worry too much about poison. Obviously you need to be worried about getting to three to some extent. Don't go crazy preventing yourself from getting to three, but it matters. And then you also need to be worried about 10, you know, but don't worry too much about in the middle. Once you've, once you're already at three poison and there's, you know, a lot of poison left before you're going to die, you don't need to worry about it too much until it becomes more of a problem. I mean, think of it just like you would any other clock, but don't overcompensate just because you're like, whoa, you know, poison is going to kill me faster than damage is. And that's, you know, true sometimes. But don't change how you're playing. Don't stop attacking unless it's a situation where it's very easy for your opponent to have lethal, just like you would do with life totals. So those are the five big tips I wanted to share. To recap, you need to have one and two drops, but you also need to have a top end or you're going to run into trouble. You don't want to block, you know, there are caveats when you should, as we discussed, but mostly blocking is difficult to do and dangerous. Uh, you need cheap interaction. Uh, blue is weak, but not unplayable. And don't worry too much about poison, other than the thresholds of three and 10. And 
To elaborate on that more, I guess, you don't need to worry about hitting three nearly as much if you're not playing black-white, though it could be relevant. Against black-white is where it, it does actually matter. So, with those tips out of the way, let's do a crack a pack now. As usual, I'll show you a pack one, pick one. I'll talk about what I would first pick out of the pack and tell you about how I feel about all the cards in it. All right, our first common is Sky Scythe Engulfer. So I know I said you need to have top curve, and this can be sort of passable uh, if you have to have it, but there's way better things, especially in green, that you'd rather have, you know, at, at four, five, and six than this thing. Um, it's okay, certainly. But it doesn't usually make the cut, and it's certainly not something you first pick. You know, it's just a big reach trampler that can be blocked by flyers, you know, comes up some. But uh, mostly it's not that impressive in terms of efficiency, and it doesn't have any special synergy with, like, anything going on. So definitely don't want to take it here. Next, there's Vanish Into Eternity. I mean, this is another card that generally shouldn't really be making the cut for you, especially, um, you know, in your main deck. Sometimes you might side it in if you're playing best of three, but it's just woefully inefficient in a format where you really need cheap interaction. And, you know, the fact it costs six to deal with a creature is frankly laughable. And sure, it can target other things earlier and make a difference, but there aren't so many targets in this format that you really need to have Vanish into Eternity ready to go in your main deck. So definitely not something you pick and really not something that makes the cut most of the time. That can't be said about the next card though, which is Hex Gold Slash. This is, I think, Red's best common. Um, you know, it's premium removal. Sure, it's only really ever gonna be a one for one, but it's so cheap. Um, and efficient, you know, it kills a huge number of creatures in the format that don't have toxic. And then if the creature does have toxic, well, it can basically kill every toxic creature in the format. There's probably a few exceptions like the huge giant and stuff like that in the black green signpost uncommon, but you know what I mean. It kills almost everything. It is cheap interaction. It's one of these cards that you can use where you're like, well, I mean, my opponent's probably gonna use a trick, but I can block and hold up my trick my, or my removal spell to use in response to their trick, so setting up a trade here isn't the worst thing. Killing three or four drops with Toxic with it feels especially good. You just pay so little for so much, and Hex Gold Slash is an excellent common, one I would be happy to first pick. Next up, it's Carnivorous Canopy, kind of in the same category as Vanish into Eternity and Sky Scythe Engulfer. It can be like your 23rd card. You know, it's not an utter disaster if you play it, but it doesn't target enough things. It's not that efficient at what it does. And for that reason, you just aren't that interested in playing it. Next up, it's Quicksilver Fisher. You know, this is a common that, a blue common that is okay, but it just doesn't do enough to pull you into the color at all. It's just too weak. Um, I don't know what they needed to do to this card. I mean, obviously, if it just drew you the card instead of looting, that would make a big difference. Um, I don't know what they needed to do to it to make it a good common, but in this day and age, a five mana four three flyer just isn't that great anymore. And the ETB ability here is minimal enough, and this format is enough about playing earlier creatures that you know you don't really want to use up a five drop slot on something that's this mediocre. So still on Hex Gold Slash. Next up, it's Branch Blight Stalker. This is the second best common we've seen so far. That's how bad the commons have been. It's a perfectly fine two drop. Um, especially if you're interested in doing some toxic stuff, uh, you know, it does the job. It is, there are a bunch of one drops it's bad against, which sometimes feels bad, um, but it's fine. Uh, Barbed Batter Fist, this is another pretty good red common. It's nowhere near as good as Hex Gold Slash, but the fact that it's an artifact, the fact that it's an equipment, the fact that it gives you a two mana three one, and then you have this very small cost to pay to sort of move around this power boost, you know, moving it to flyers or things with first strike or whatever, uh, feels pretty good, and you know you get a lot of utility out of this little ability using it over and over again. It's probably the second best common now. I think I would take it over. I would take it over Branch Blight Stalker, um, Leonin Lightbringer. You know, the equipment deck is is a thing, but um, I don't usually find myself playing the Lightbringer that often. It's you know a lot of these commons have been bad in this pack. And this is this one is better than like the Quicksilver Fishers and Sky Salt and Gulf Sky Scythe and Golfers for sure, but it's not that good. And it's another card that I find it doesn't make the cut that often. Um, you know, three mana three two ward two just isn't that good. And sure, it gets a buff out of being equipped. You know, putting the batter fist on it can feel pretty good sometimes, but 
it's nothing special and certainly not something you take with an early pick. Um, it's Maybe it's the third best common so far, though. Uh, Surgical Skull Bomb is next. Um, I've talked about these before. You know, I like the ones, especially the blue and white one, because the blue white deck's about artifacts. And, you know, you end up playing them and it's they're fine, but you don't take them early. Uh, Annihilating Glare is next. This format hasn't lined up super well for Annihilating Glare to work that effectively. Um, it's okay. Uh, it works more often in a deck like Red Black than in anything else. Sometimes you have um, a Might to give up, but you don't have that good of Sacrifice Fodder. And when you don't, it's a five mana removal spell. It's certainly um, solid. And... Probably the second, well, it's probably worse than Barbed Batter Fist, so it's probably the third best common here. So nothing nothing amazing. In some formats, and I mean, we've seen this card before and had it be really good, uh, Eaten Alive in uh, one of the Innistrad sets where we had all of those 2-2 zombies. Like, it it was really good. Uh, Annihilating Glare doesn't quite get there. Um, you know, playing one in your, you play one in a lot of your black decks, but uh, you don't really end up with that much synergy for it. Next up, there's Chittering Skitterling, moving into our uncommons. This is a powerful one, but it's kind of a, um, it's a build around, basically. You know, they're sure, like, black decks are supposed to be about poisoning your opponent, but the only black deck that really has a critical mass of ways to quickly poison the opponent is black-white. You know, black-green can do it, but I don't love that deck Overall, I mean, it's an oak, it's not an unplayable deck. There aren't really any of those in the format, but the Skitterling really slots well into black white, where you have the combination of both the ability to get corrupted online and you usually have mites and stuff to sacrifice for value. And once you have corrupted online, I mean, the Skitterling is quite good. It really does a great job, but it's build aroundy enough that I think I'm still on Hex Gold Slash. Thrumming Bird is next. This is a pretty good blue uncommon. I don't think it's quite as good as the Retrofitter or the Tamiyo's Icy Manipulator thing that I mentioned earlier, um, but it's pretty good. Um, the Blue-Black deck is one, it's probably my favorite deck in the format. It doesn't come together that often. It's the one, you know, the, the thing you want to do most with that one is proliferate. And if you get the Signpost Uncommon and you get the 2-mana 1-3 who drains your opponent every time you proliferate, suddenly you have a reason to really value Thrumming Bird but unless you're in that deck, it's really not that good. I mean, it's okay in blue-red as well. Um, you'll play it there, but it's definitely not something you want to take early. It's sort of like the Skitterling where it needs the right deck to really function. So that's why I'm still in on Hex Gold Slash here, which is good in every single red deck and is honestly sort of comparable in power level to all of these cards that take more effort. Anyway, uh, next up, it's Gleeful Demolition. You know, this pack was loaded with... Uh, cards that are like your 23rd card or a sideboard card. And this is another one, I think, um, you know, using it on your own stuff to get three one ones doesn't feel that good. Um, blowing up your opponent's thing for one mana can feel pretty good. But a lot of the artifacts in the format are equipment with Fermiridin, in which case you don't really accomplish much. Um, and there's still not really enough targets for this to be great. So still on Hex Gold Slash. We do have a pretty good rare. It's Malkator Purity Overseer. I think the best blue deck in the format is the blue-white one. That's the artifact one. Malkator, you know, is a three mana one one that makes a three three. It's already a very good card. And then if you can ever get three or more artifacts and play in a single turn, it cranks out another one. And you know, if you draft a blue-white artifact deck and you have Malkator, you'll probably pull that off like once per draft. Like it's doable, not something that's going to be like, yeah, I'm, this is an engine. I'm going to crank out an extra golem every time. But it is something that you'll do sometimes. There's enough, you know, cards that make multiple mites and stuff that you can make it happen. That said, it is multicolored. It really you know, blue-white is a deck that I like, but I do think red is the best color in the format, and we have the best red common in this pack. It'll make it into any deck. We can even splash it in some situations, though splashing is not a huge uh, feature in this format for the most part, but I think I would still just take the slash. I think we're in on the really good common here. Um, I do think Malkator is easily the second best card in this pack, um, and if it was monocolored, like, I'd probably take it over Slash, but, you know, you have to, when you factor in what your pack one pick one is, you you first have to think, sure, how powerful is the card, but then, how likely is it that I'm going to play this in my deck? And both of those should sort of, you know, combine into 
a value in your head for for the card and and then you pick the one at the higher value and while Malkator I think is probably more powerful than Hex Gold Slash the chances of playing it are a lot lower uh, than Hex Gold Slashes and I don't think Hex Gold Slash is that much worse than Malkator either like it's close it's very close so just take the monocolored card here. You're also not passing like any good great red cards. I mean, the, the batter fist is OK, but the person next to you is very likely to take Malkator out of this pack. Um, and at that point, you know, knowing you're the person next to you is trying to go blue white. It's pretty good news if you've just taken a red card. So that'll do it for this week's episode. I think next week I'll do a rundown of my tiers for the different archetypes, the different color pairs in the format. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like it and share it. If you want to see more videos, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to catch up on past videos and see draft videos of this format and other stuff, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.